The year is 2006. I am 13 years old. The war in Afghanistan and the Iraq war were in full swing. The United States housing bubble was careening towards a massive burst and the number one song of the year was Bad Day by Daniel Powder. You had a bad day. One day, I was aimlessly browsing around on the computer my family all shared. I often spent my time listening to 30 second previews of songs in the iTunes store, injecting passive snippets of sound from across the music spectrum into my brain. A taste test of sound. On this occasion though, I came upon this album cover. I was initially struck by the gritty look of the knobs and the makeshift tape repairs. Then I read the name. Atari Teenage Riot, 1992 to 2000. Atari. I recognize that. Teenage. I'm 13. Riot. Whoa. What? Press Press Bursting from the meek computer speakers is a jagged electric guitar intro, chugging and punk tinge snarling. The beat then comes in, a sudden vicious techno blast engulfed the song. This 30 second snippet struck a chord with me, but then the lyrics entered my head. These lyrics were violent and scary to my 13-year-old brain, which made it all the more enticing. And with that, I bought the album through the iTunes store without asking my dad. Ask parents permission to go online. Because I'm rebelling, and this shall be the soundtrack to my rebellion. My rebellion soundtrack being a greatest hits collection from the then dissolved digital hardcore band Atari Teenage Riot. Atari Teenage Riot are a legendary and innovative band from Berlin, Germany. First forming in 1992 and then dissolving in 2001, this group is known for their anti-establishment, anti-Nazi, anti-fascist, and anarchistic, chaotic, musical onslaught. Their sound combines elements of techno, metal, punk, hip-hop, and noise, coining their own style as digital hardcore. With five studio albums, countless singles, compilations, and live recordings, this band hit the world like a flaming comet. Throughout the 1990s, they toured the U.S. with bands like Rage Against the Machine, Nine Inch Nails, and Ministry. This was the heavier side of popular music. But their cutting-edge sound led them to tours with the likes of Moby, Beck, and even the Wu-Tang Clan. When I found the Atari Teenage Riot Best Of album, it was the same time that a close friend and I were getting into Enter the 36 Chambers by the Wu-Tang Clan, so I could not imagine how amazing those shows were. Nevertheless, I found this band well after their influence was already entrenched in the heavy and electronic music genres across the world. It was 2006 five years after their initial breakup and the death of a founding member, and the fizzling out of the more extreme genres in the mainstream consciousness. But at this impressionable age, I was ready to dive into their musical output. Maybe I'll send my dad $9.99 for this album after all these years. Yo, Pops. I gotta tell you something. Atari Teenage Riot formed in the year 1992 in Berlin, Germany. The shadow of the fallen Berlin Wall still looming over the politics of the day. The group began as a trio, consisting of Alec Empire, Hannon Elias, and MC Karl Krack. These three joined forces to combat the neo-Nazi subculture that was brewing up in Germany at the time. They fought this pervasive movement with a loud and furious combination of sounds from the world of hardcore punk and German techno, which was dominating the underground music scene at the time. Alec Empire was born in West Berlin in 1972 to working-class German socialist parents. His family, like all in Germany, were affected by the Nazi regime. His grandfather was a radical activist in the 1930s who was actually killed in a Nazi concentration camp. In a 2007 interview, Empire said he passed the Berlin Wall every day while walking to school. 
the sight of armed patrol guards affected him from an early age. Berlin, in the late 70s and early 1980s, became, in Empire's words, probably the most left radical place in Germany. Terrorists, a lot of demonstrations, and probably the first address to hear the latest American music because of the radio shows the U.S. soldiers brought to Berlin. Hannah Elias was also born in 1972, but in Rhineland Palatinate, Germany, located in the west of the country. She spent the early years of her life living in Syria. In opposition to empire, Elias grew up in a conservative household, describing her father as an autocrat. Her father was Syrian and her mother was German. When her family eventually moved to Berlin, Elias ended up running away from home. She found refuge in the Berlin underground punk and goth music scenes. Without support from her family, Elias had to scrape for money and squatted for shelter. Elias found herself panhandling on the streets for Deutschmarkers at one point. Lack of support for her musical interests led Elias to working in highly experimental music on used and broken equipment. Elias strived to carve her own way, working with an artist named Captain SpaceX in her early days. After cutting her teeth in the underground, she came into contact with Alec Empire through a mutual friend. MC Karl Krak was born in 1971 in the southern African kingdom of Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland. Born Karl Baum, there is not much biographical information available on his life. After some digging, I was able to find a YouTube channel that actually found footage of one of Karl Krak's early bands. Karl is the lead singer in a Clash-esque punk rock group. The band was apparently called Secret Moment, it is unclear when exactly he arrived in Berlin, but it is noted that once he was here, he stated his dissatisfaction with the music scene in 1992. These three musical firebrands joined forces in early 1992 and went headlong into politically charged music. The name for the trio was inspired by a Portuguese Joe song entitled Teenage Riot, but adding Atari after the Atari ST computer used to produce the music, something Alec Empire still says should be used to make music. Alec Empire was entrenched in the underground punk music scene, and just after the reunification of Germany, he became a part of the rave music scene of East Berlin. His musical mind pulled influences at every turn. Empire gained attention as a DJ along with Han and Elias, which garnered them some record label attention. As the early 90s trance techno scene became decadent, there grew a fringe infusion with neo-Nazi movements. This fueled Empire, Elias, and eventually MC Karl Krak to form a like-minded trio of angry opposition to neo-fascism in the music scene. The trio's early music was met with immediate controversy. Elias claims the techno scene was pissed off at ATR for their use of electric guitar in their brand of distorted techno. They fought against their detractors with increased volume. The band independently released a series of early singles. These singles were the titular ATR, the track Midi Junkies, and the unflinching It's called Hetzjagd auf Nazis! Hunt down and kill the Nazis! Hunt down and kill the Nazis! Fuck the KKK! These tracks are furious experimental techno powerhouses, full of breakbeats, shouted vocals, rapping, and politically charged messages. Hannah Elias' vocal style was erratic, wildly fluctuating from calm spoken word to hellfire shrieks. Alec Empire chopped funk and rap breakbeats, albeit at about double the speed, along with a furious wall of distorted guitar riffage. Empire's vocal style was loud and boasting, creating an engrossing chaos of dance-drenched fury. MC Carl Crack was rapping at a breakneck speed, with a vitriol of disaffected youth. A hardcore punk energy pours out of Carl Crack's flow, like an unhinged rapping Henry Rollins. All of this momentum led to the group signing to European label Phonograph Records in 1993, off the back of their singles and growing controversy. What Phonograph Records did not take into account 
was just how anti-establishment ATR were. Upon receiving a large cash advance with their record contract, the trio immediately started their own record label, dubbed Digital Hardcore Recordings, thus controlling their path and giving a name to their new genre. A commercially viable demo was never delivered to Phonograph Records, so right off the bat, ATR were making it known that they were loud, aggressive, unapologetically political, and ready to take over the music scene. After the series of singles and an EP entitled Kids Are United, Atari Teenage Riot's debut album was set to release, and on March 1st, 1995, the digital hardcore blueprint was dubbed. Delete Delete yourself! It has to be yelled, you know, that's the proper expression of the punctuation. The album was originally entitled 1995, the stark original album cover depicting an Uzi on a white background. This 46 minute and 55 seconds is nothing short of pummeling. Opening with a bit of deception with the track, Start the Riot! I would die for peanut butter. Same here, Hannon. What comes with this song is a classic breakbeat. Some heavy video game-like synth sounds bringing the listener in. Like a distorted game of Pong. This all puts you at ease. A laid-back feel, which is pulled out from under you. Go! The track turns into an all-out wall of noise, vicious, distorted, punishing kicks, and the trio in unison screaming, Start the riot! Start the, riot! Start the, riot! the opening track is a rallying cry for uprising, flipping cars, hitting the streets, and getting down. The collage of sounds includes samples pulled from an anime entitled 3X Three Eyes. So yeah, simultaneously an aggressive splash of Electronic Fury and anime fans. This harsh collage of genre clash brings the listener into the world of the album. The message the song sends is, Tighten up, cause here's an explosion! The album barely leaves you room to breathe, as it proceeds into tracks like Into the Death, which is nearly a death metal song at its speed. This song actually contains a sample from Dutch extreme metal act Thanatos. Raver bashing sounds like Fatboy Slim railed an espresso shot off of a broken piece of glass. The aforementioned track Speed is equal parts aggressive and catchy, being the single that captured the eyes of the music publications and fans. This single was showcased with the first ever ATR music video, a strobe light soaked and underground bunker looking performance video that illustrates the trio's raw energy. Sex is the first break on the album's track list. This is the time of the album to take a break and let some of the smooth mid-90s techno sound engulf you. The sound may be very familiar to late 90s down-tempo electronic music fans, like Massive Attack or Chibo Matto, or even Bjork at times. Elias' soft whisper in the song is alluring, but sinister. Like someone lurking around a dark corner. Test the world. United colors. I told myself I wasn't about to give up. The lyrics themselves are a critique of modernity. A world of screens and at a loss of what to do with oneself. Simply choosing to be blind and learning to love the machine. The song has a gentle nature, but a bitter twist. So at this point in the album, you're calm. And then... MIDI Junkies launches right back into the digital depths. This track is groovy and self-reflexive. Lyrically directed right back at the band themselves. This track has a mission statement like quality. 
with a chorus that screams, MIDI junkies are gonna f*** you up. And now a quick explanation of MIDI. MIDI is an acronym that stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. It is a technical standard that describes a communication protocol, digital interface, and electronic connectors that connect a wide variety of electronic musical instruments, computers, and related audio devices for playing, editing, and recording music. I particularly love these lyrics because they are essentially poking fun at themselves. MC Carl Crack is laying out a diatribe about ATR's position in the underground and what it means to be a band in the public eye. So Atari Teenage Riot were not just rage without meaning. They were self-aware, reflexive, and thoughtful in their approach to musical expression. The title track, Delete Yourself, is a live recording from Glasgow, Scotland. The full title of the song is Delete Yourself, You've Got No Chance to Win. The song opens with a monologue of futuristic imagery. You look up the video album. He quickly realized that this is not just another video game. ATR were embracing cyberpunkish imagery. Their music was electronic, so the parallel to creating virtual worlds within video games were no longer a far off idea. The technological advancement of the world was rapid. ATR were envisioning the potential of evolving existential horrors. Hunt Down the Nazis deserves mention again for being an unvetted protest song against the rise of neo-Nazis. This is another live recording from Berlin in February of 1994, with wildly square wave synths blaring over the beat like a bullhorn. The song is deliberately aggressive. This track started as an Alec Empire solo track, but it is an attack on the German neo-Nazi movement that was invading the dance and rave music scenes. The track opens with Han and Elias and Alec Empire speaking in their native German together. Alec saying, We have been waiting for this track. Hannon saying, Chasing Nazis is our next track. Alec responding, We certainly played at every gig, and now we will continue to play it until not a single Nazi is among us. Okay, can you turn it up? Hannon responds, Everyone turn it up. This track speaks for itself and shows ATR's commitments to their ideals and their use of their platform to bring attention to dickless neo-Nazism. Cyberpunks are dead, kids are united, and their namesake, Atari Teenage Riot, all come back and keep the energy high. The album comes to a close with Riot 1995, a coda for their future, heavy, unflinching, in your face, and spitting into the fire. With Delete Yourself, the Atari Teenage Riot blueprint was set. Their music and ideology was forward thinking. When I was getting into the album as a 13 year old, the political impact was somewhat over my head, but I was captivated by the riffs, the beats, and the energy. I think that's part of the magic of Atari Teenage Riot. Their politics are present, but their music alone conveys anger and force. Delete Yourself was Atari Teenage Riot's flag, firmly slammed into the sand and spat upon. After the atomic bomb of their debut studio album, ATR began to gain traction around the world. In 1996, none other than the Beastie Boys brought the Delete Yourself album to the United States, releasing it to their Grand Royal Records imprint, retitled as Burn, Berlin, Burn in the United States. Mike D himself of the Beastie Boys referred to ATR's music as the most punk shit ever. Han and Elias later claimed that Kathleen Hanna, the American Riot Girl pioneering lead singer of the band Bikini Kill, is who brought Atari Teenage Riot's music to the Beastie Boys. Kathleen Hanna would later make an appearance on an ATR album. This record deal brought the band stateside. With all this momentum and attention, Atari Teenage Riot went headlong into the recording of their second album. The stage was set, and now it was time to light that stage on fire. In March of 1997, two years after their debut album, Empire, Elias, and Carl Crack released their sophomore album entitled The Future of War. Instead of streamlining their sound, ATR went heavier. At times grinding and cacophonous, the future of war pulls no punches and in fact smashes glass over your head for good measure. The opening track, Get Up While You Can.
loud metallic clanging with a detuned guitar chugging like a techno Black Sabbath. Then the screamed refrain of Get up while you can! 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 Get up! The chaos reaches a fever pitch, and you are now in the world of the album. Wall of sound techno on full display, nothing short of an assault on the senses to open the record. Then track two, fuck all. Sampling the infamous track Pay to Come by DC hardcore pioneers Bad Brains. Amplifying an already distorted and fast original song into an aggressive blast to the jaw. Hannah Elias leads with an authoritarian screech, breaking any standard accepted amount of distortion. The song has a simple message, and that is, fuck you, fuck everybody. The song attacks the police, the entertainment industry, and says, let's destroy the future. This song is such a high amount of unhinged anger that it gives me anxiety. Like my body is being crushed in a trash compactor of yelling German voices. You can't hold us back! A lot of the songs have exclamation points, so y you, you have to yell them. The beat is janky with a classic murky, dangerous tone, drenched with verses of apocalyptic visions by Carl Crack. Sick to Death is a cut that sounds like a Ramon song beat eaten by a MIDI controlled washing machine full of kitchen knives. The back half of this song is a groovy passage with a siren like beat that reminds me of the sounds of Death Grips. Then of course the single, Destroy 2000 Years of Culture. This is one of my absolute favorite tracks that set off my early fandom. The song has a more accessible tempo than your average ATR cut, but that does not downplay the bloodthirsty nature. The song has an internal dialogue of a radical left protester hitting the streets with the fervor of a soldier for revolution. The titular chorus is calm and collected at times. Like a calling to join the revolt and dive into the chaos without fear. As a youth, while listening to this song on my iPod Nano, walking into school, I felt like I was walking around a dystopian, fascist, technocratic future. Also, the song has an incredibly 1997 music video. Simple, with a shirtless Alec Empire in front of a green screen, spouting the lyrics to the lens with a vicious passion. While scanning through the rest of the album, you'd come to great songs like P-R-E-S-S, -S, an attack on big money press associations and their hypocrisy. Had to mention those lyrics, those are so blunt and rude that I love them. Death Star, another great track. This time, a slow and methodical burn with Hannon sounding like a Bit crushed witch pulling you into the ether. The album ends with the titular The Future of War, a dystopian black metal powerhouse. The sound is eerie 
frightening and threatening. The tempo is fast and the lyrics are bitter and framed like a warning. The sound palette gets more and more intense towards the close, like the city is collapsing upon you and you have to hold on for dear life. It is said that The Future of War is the album that got Rage Against the Machine's attention to bring Atari Teenage Riot on tour in the United States. ATR even had public shoutouts from the likes of Bjork and Dave Grohl in the music media. In summation, The Future of War is an inferno of a sophomore album. In music history, the second album can be a test of fandom. After initial success with hardcore music fan bases, there can be a pressure to go more mainstream. ATR decided to go heavier, more alienating, more political, and harder edged. Just listen to the track, Not Your Business, and feel your heart rate increasing. The album finds a more polished uniformity to their song compositions while experimenting with more straightforward hardcore punk, more vocals, and deeper lyrical themes. The impact of this album was intense, being banned and censored in their native Germany. Apparently, the lyrical attacks on German racism and corruption in the halls of power were meant to be too radical. It was placed on the... Oh... Uh, oh, the Federal Department for Media Harmful to Young Persons. Which essentially means it cannot be advertised or sold to minors. Like in the United States, when the Parents Music Resource Center and the subsequent Explicit Lyrics sticker were placed on albums in the mid-1980s. Alec Empire himself is quoted as saying, The future of war was notable for its left-rooted critique of the modern high-tech war, as we had seen it all some years previously during the Gulf War. The bluntness of their political ideology was seen as dangerous to the establishment. Atari Teenage Riot were supercharged, breaking ground in the United States and being on tour more and more throughout the world. They were in indie music publications and being shouted out by trendsetters. The censorship they experienced only boosted their profile and their domination was about to go into full force. In 1996, a fourth member came into the Atari Teenage Riot fold, expanding their ranks and injecting them with a new spark of sonic possibilities. This new musician was Nick Endo. Nick Endo grew up with a Japanese mother and a German father, but was born in Texas. Endo ended up living in Frankfurt, Germany in the mid-1990s before landing in Berlin. This was where she came to meet the members of ATR. Endo joined in the middle of the band's 1997 tour in support of the future of war, finding common ground in the radical politics and distorted landscapes. Now, Nick is described as a noise musician, and if you listen to her 1998 EP White Heat, it's clear why. Endo also had a go-to visual style as well, adorned in black leather and with white face paint with the Japanese characters, meaning resistance on her cheek. Nick Gendo's first show with Atari Teenage Riot was in early 1997 at the South by Southwest Music Festival in Austin, Texas. The deck was stacked for Atari Teenage Riot to command full-scale domination of the music industry. In the interim, Hannah Elias, MC Carl Crack, and Nick Gendo all had solo releases on digital hardcore records, showing that this was a collective of individual artists with vision and unique voices a band of experimental minds and innovators that were not going to be tied down. Two years later, in May of 1999, the fruits of digital hardcore birthed their third studio album, entitled 60 Second Wipeout. As is tradition for ATR, the album opens without fear, 
Revolution action. A call to action. It's time to live and it's time to die. It's time to live and it's time to die. It's time to live and it's time to die. It's time to live. Revolution action. It's time to live and it's time to die. A contradicting phrase expressing the very nature of revolutionary upheaval. Revolution is now, and we won't all survive. The guitar riff for this song could shave down the hairs inside your cochlear. The song has ATR's most famous music video attached to it. The video is a bureaucratic dystopian future, death by cubicle type stuff, incredibly 1999 special effects, but they have a lot of charm and oddness to them. There's a story element as well, some world building, with robots and human characters, and the acting, oh it's just incredible. Things feel empty lately. You have put your dreams to sleep, Mark. Highly suggest watching this video. The band appears towards the tail end, implying that their music is causing all this chaos, like noise terrorists infiltrating the status quo. I love Carl Crack's verse on this song. The band is not to be messed with. At least that is the image they are pushing. The final scene of the video is a must-see. The Revolution Action music video was released on VHS and I need that. Later, the video was banned by MTV because of the violent nature. I recall when banned music videos on MTV were like a badge of honor for bands and artists. So Revolution Action is a jaw-breaking opener. The album is structured to have several seamless transitions connecting the tracks like a grand opus. The second track, by any means necessary. The ripping beat of this track could destroy your car's speakers. This album feels like ATR was reveling in the controlled madness. There was a higher production budget, and the music media had attention on them. So they answered with more distortion that was clear and brutal. This is the most polished album of this run, while potentially making it the most accessible. By 1999, electronic sound and experimentation was carving a space in popular music. Nine Inch Nails, Downward Spiral in 94, The Fragile in 99, Beck's Odelay in 96, Massive Attack's Mezzanine in 98, Moby's Play in 99, The Prodigy's The Fat of the Land in 97, Your Stereo Labs were getting popular at this time. The late 90s culture had this odd futuristic tinge. The Matrix, the Y2K Scare, the movie Hackers, the Dreamcast, I guess. There was an aesthetic of technological internet-connected digital worlds. The sound of 60 Second Wipeout is like throwing gasoline on all this fire, along with four or five Molotov cocktails, you know, for good measure. Look no further than their May 1st, 99 performance in Berlin, Germany. This footage is ATR at the top of their powers, in the middle of a massive crowd blaring their music and message at max volume, all from a moving truck bed rolling down the streets. May 1st is an important day of protest in Germany. I'll let Alec Empire elaborate on it with his own words. A Thai teenage riot performing on the 1st of May in 1999 in the streets of Berlin at a demonstration which was organized by the anti-fascist action. You have to understand that these demonstrations go on almost every year on the, on the 1st of May. It's, it's an historic day uh, where workers would go out and demonstrate. And this time we played there because same time, Germany was speaking about getting involved in the Kosovo bombings, which were going on around that time. And for us, this was very emotional, because we strongly believed um, that Germany should never be involved in another war again, because of the history of the country, and should not be involved in an attack war. You know, leaving the discussion aside now, you know, it was very, very arguable that you know, you could just throw bombs onto another country and hope the situation would improve. So the demonstration completely got out of control. 
Um, I remember people told us to stop playing because it was just, you know, f almost like putting fuel into the fire. I think it becomes very obvious when you see the footage that the police had a lot of interest into, like, beating into the crowd. And, you know, you see people, you know, holding up their hands and saying, look, don't, I'm not doing anything. And you just see them just hitting into the crowd. What is very interesting uh, about this footage is that it was used later on in court because, um, you know, it clearly, like, it shows that the cops were just out of control. It was a peaceful demonstration. Um, and uh, it was very intense performing at the demonstration. It was the idea of a Tarantino trial to do stuff outside of the normal concert halls and the normal clubs. Of course, at the end, we got arrested uh, for it. All of this political action tied in with the radical, forward-thinking, aggressive music truly shows Atari Teenage Riot's integrity. The band even getting arrested for performing in the midst of street protests. Now back to the album. Western Decay, Atari Teenage Riot 2, and Ghost Chase, these are all uncompromising metallic bangers. I feel like I am hearing the Nick Endo influence with the sheer wall of noise across the frequency spectrum. Too Dead For Me is another single from the album. The titular refrain is instantaneous and catchy, like a Ramones song. The lyrics also have this odd sexual tinge to them, which makes me a bit unclear of what the song is about. This video showcases the band performing in the back of a truck that is structured like a heist movie. An excellent song, one that I would show any burgeoning ATR fan. USA Fade Out is a crusty white noise adventure with whispered vocals. Yes, it is. The noise textures of this album are intoxicating. The virus has been spread and digital hardcore are tough as nails, bit crushed and furious. The breakbeats are swallowed in distortion. The track Death of a President DIY is another lovely cacophonous adventure into assassination. A harrowing scream against fascist leadership and the death they cause globally. I love this particular lyrical passage. Your Uniform Does Not Impress Me is a stare into militant control. The song is a clear challenge to authoritarianism. No Success is a thumping track with a slightly slower tempo. The song also features vocals from Kathleen Hanna from Bikini Kill, returning the favor of spreading their music in the United States. This chaotic onslaught comes to a close with Anarchy 999. The song is a warning of impending revolution. One thing is for sure, ATR pull no punches on the lyrical front. Later in the song, there is an appearance by the Bushwick Brooklyn rap collective The Arsonists, who bring some extra fury, closing out the album on a clear and relevant message. With that, 60 Second Wipeout is complete. The most polished release from Atari Teenage Riot. Polished like being punched in the head with a metal glove with glass tape to it. 60 Second Wipeout was ATR's most successful album to date. A dense, abusive experience that I love. Getting a lot of attention from the music publications, Entertainment Weekly even described this album of wielding breakbeats like ninja stars and synth bleats like nunchucks. The album even charted in the US Heat Seekers and the UK Independent Album charts. The heat was on for Atari Teenage Riot, and they were at the height of their influence and power. The fever pitch, though, 
was about to be reached. After relentless promotion, touring, and politically fueled performances, Han and Elias wanted to leave Atari Teenage Riot. Elias cites several reasons for her departure. Tensions rose within the band, Elias claiming that the democracy of the group's creative output began to evaporate, leading to Alec Empire having most of the control in the direction of the band. The non-commercial edge the band had started with was also turning more mainstream, which did not interest Elias. She even felt pressure from the two pregnancies she had while ATR was gaining popularity. Atari Teenage Riot was poised to tour the United States with Nine Inch Nails in the year 2000, but the shows ended up being canceled. During this tumultuous time, MC Carl Crack was also having issues with his mental state. It has been said that he struggled with psychosis attacks and had issues in bouts of medicated states. The band stayed together enough to perform at the legendary Big Day Out Music Festival in Australia in the summer of 2000. This is a fantastic performance that illustrates regardless of internal band tensions, MC Carl Crack, Hannah Elias, Nick Gendo, and Alec Empire were a force to be reckoned with, leaving nothing on the stage and giving every ounce of spirit they have to bring the energy to the people. In the mid-2000s, the band released the non-album single, Rage, along with a music video. The song features guitar work from none other than Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine, a great, more straightforward, dare I say poppy song for ATR. But for the music video, you can noticeably see the absence of MC Carl Crack. MC Carl Crack was recuperating from psychosis attacks during this time. It is hard to find clear-cut information about what Carl was going through during this moment. Apparently, those close to Carl have said that the doctors had informed him that his psychosis attacks may worsen with age. A clip from a Oscar ATR show, potentially Carl's final performance with the band, shows a very dejected Carl Crack going through the motions. Then, on September 6, 2001, Carl Baum was found dead in his Berlin apartment. His death was ruled an overdose of unspecific pills. Some, including Hannah Elias herself, have called the death a suicide. Carl was said to be working on solo material at the time of his death. MC Carl Crack was the rage-spitting rapper of Atari Teenage Riot expanding their musical voice and being a constant face for their relenting energy and political message. He was a one-of-a-kind musician, dead at just 30 years old. Shortly after Carl's death, Han and Elias officially left Atari Teenage Riot, this death being her final straw. Alec Empire and Nick Endo remained, but it was understood that Atari Teenage Riot was over ending the noisy, shrieking, groovy, metallic, and in your fucking face madness that was Atari Teenage Riot. In less than 10 years, the band had created a genre, their own record label, and toured the world. And now it was over. Han and Elias, Nick Endo, and Alec Empire all embarked on solo projects. Endo and Empire stayed on the digital hardcore recording label, while Elias started her own spin-off independent record label called Fatal Record Company. All of these musicians continued to break genre boundaries and bring noise to the people. Then, in 2006, Digital Hardcore Records released Atari Teenage Riot 1992 through 2000, the very compilation that we started on. You see that? The speed, the intensity of their music, and almost cathartically ending with a sudden burnout. Oh. Oh. Oh, and then... So yeah, Atari Teenage Riot did reunite. You know, sorta. Late 2009 saw rumors that Han and Elias and Alec Empire were in talks to do a series of reunion shows together. Sadly, these never actually came to fruition, 
The first show was canceled only 30 minutes before it was set to start. Issues apparently arose with Elias' voice, but this could be rumor. Regardless, in January 2010, ATR announced reunion shows for Europe. Alec Empire and Nick Endo returned, Endo taking over vocal duties for Elias. The new MC for the band was CX Kidtronics from Brooklyn. Side note, CX Kidtronics is awesome, especially his 2013 album, Crack Attack, Ballad of Eli's Gift. Regardless, this reunion in name was met with much excitement. The band would play most of the major European music festivals of 2010. The Reading Festival, the Leeds Festival, the Fusion Festival, as well as Japan's Supersonic Festival. The band even went on to headline Berlin Festival, a cathartic headlining spot for the band's history. All of this momentum led to new tour dates being added. The reunion was in full swing. In March 2010, the new iteration of Atari Teenage Riot released the single Activate, the first new Atari Teenage Riot song in 10 years. The band would go on to get signed to a deal with Demok Records, Steve Aoki's record label, leading to their 2011 album, Is This Hyper Real? The album was met with critical acclaim and excitement, but had some fair share of backlash. The album lyrically dealing with hacking, WikiLeaks, and even the online hacker group Anonymous. The band had developed a relationship with the infamous hacking group in the midst of the Occupy Wall Street and Occupy London movements. This new ATR... ATR 2K10, if you will, continued the reunion into a full-fledged reformation. 2014 saw another new record entitled Reset. The shows continued and the band soldiered on with this new direction. I'm giving a quick summation of these albums and the reunion because I want to focus on the band's core history. So let's wrap up! Atari Teenage Riot were dangerous, loud, distorted, unapologetically political, and uncompromising. They formed at a time when the musical landscape was expanding. Loud, aggressive music was entering the mainstream consciousness alongside this rise with the electronic music coming up from the underground. Atari Teenage Riot resided in this nexus. Genre expanding, punk, violent, fast, and violent. I said that. This was a one-of-a-kind band. A one in a million firestorm of music. I came to ATR when they had already burned out, but listening to them lit my world aflame and expanded my mind and definitely crushed the frequency spectrum of my ears. I highly suggest one of these days kicking off your shoes, lowering the lights, maybe make a midday cup of black coffee, put your feet up. Get cozy, fire up a Bandcamp link, and throw on some classic Atari Teenage Riot. And feel your blood begin to boil. The future of love. The future. That's it. Mm-hmm.